want to tell you today that what I'm going to share with you is something that I believe is important for every person in this room to hear. For you that are joining us on online church, it's important for you to hear. It's important for those of you that may see this at some point by the miracle of video and YouTube. It's important for you to hear. This is about what we can do to make a difference. How can we make a difference? What's one of the ways we can make, make a difference? How do we get there? Now, I want to tell you before I get into this, this during this period of time I've been looking at this, um, over a few weeks, but really in this last week, is something that's made me more uncomfortable than anything I've probably ever brought to you. Now, I will tell you that every week, as I bring the Word of God to you, I feel uncomfortable. First of all, because I feel inadequate. <laughs> and I think that's maybe a good thing, because I don't depend on my ability. I, I depend on the anointing of the Holy Spirit. But I will tell you that I'm made uncomfortable in areas because God is working on me just like I hope and pray that he works on you. Because we are all a work in progress. Amen. We've not arrived. We've not gotten there. You don't hit a plateau and coast in this life. And if you are today finding yourself in that place, my prayer during this week, and I have prayed these words, I hope this makes you extraordinarily uncomfortable. Not because I don't want you to be comfortable. Because I want you to be challenged. I want you to have everything that God has for you. How many of us want to live in the blessings of God? I think that's all of us. When we invite God into areas of our life, it opens up pathways of blessing. The more areas that we give him control, those pathways widen. Romans 12.1. Dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice. Say sacrifice. The kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. The NIV translation of that scripture says this is your true that last sentence, this is your true and proper worship. This is another verse. This is the verse that, I don't know if you remember, and you talk about this so many times, the first, I believe, am I correct, the first verse, text verse that you ever used in the first sermon you ever preached, Galatians 2.20. Am I right? Yeah. This is the New Living Translation. My old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Those two verses that I just shared that's our primary text for today could be summarized in one single word, surrender. Now I'm going to tell you and I can tell by maybe the response I just got. <laughs> the word surrender can make people uncomfortable. In fact, sometimes I think it can even be daunting, not just a little uncomfortable. Many people, what we like to do is call it commitment. Well, let me tell you something about the difference between those. Well, even when you say commitment, you say, well, look, Pastor Billy, I'm making a commitment. I'm committing something to God. That, that's a good thing, right? That, that, that can't be a bad thing. I'm not saying that it is. What I'm saying is this. Surrender and commitment are not equivalent. Commitment is what I want to do for God. Surrender is what God wants me to do. Commitment, what I can or have achieved for God. Surrender, what God has done, I can do nothing. Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. 
Commitment is focus, your focus is on diligence. Surrender focuses on obedience. Commitment is a self-centered, and not entirely, but follow me here, a, a self-centered living approach. Surrender is a Christ-centered living approach. Commitment, see what I've sacrificed to serve God. Surrender, I see only the cross and his sacrifice for me. Commitment is a state, and I'm not saying there's, the word commitment is to, not, is to be completely discarded here, but commitment is a state of where we are still calling the shots. We're still in charge. We control how much commitment we want to make. We control what we want to do. But here's the way it needs to be. We need to know what God wants us to do rather than what we want to do for God. Do you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to say it again. We need to know what God wants us to do rather than what we want to do for God. It must be all about him and not at all about us and what we can do. Only, only about his will and plans and purposes and not at all about our desires and what we want to do. Commitment, surrender, they may seem similar, but they're not. And when you look at the scripture, and I believe entirely, I'll say, certainly any that we're talking about here today, but entirely, when you look at scripture, what you see in the things that are happening is surrender, not commitment. Is anybody uncomfortable yet? Just raise your hand. It's okay. Okay. There's a book that was written called The, Pow the uh, Incredible Power of Kingdom Authority, written by a man named Adrian Rogers. And if you know Adrian Rogers, he's a great pastor. In fact, our uh, family has a connection to Adrian Rogers. Uh, by the way, can we welcome my uh, uncle who's visiting with us today, Charles, and his wife, Lonnie? <laughs> my, this is my mom's brother. Charles just wrote, I'm going to break off here a minute. Charles just wrote a book of devotional. And I want him to come back one day. I'm putting you on the spot. So here it is. Too bad. And bring those with him and just share a little bit. Maybe you guys could pick one up. Uh, it's really amazing, but God's doing a great work in his life. But I'll just leave that at that for now. But my, this is Charles and his sister, Carolyn. So he's my uncle. We have another sister. We have two other sisters, Brenda and, and Martha. Martha, their sister, worked, uh, and her husband, Max, worked for Adrian Rogers at First Baptist of Merritt Island for the years that he was there before he went to Memphis. Of course, he preached all over the world, wrote books. So many of you know who Adrian Rogers is. Okay. In this book, Adrian Rogers and Reverend Joseph Son, a Romanian pastor and author who had survived many years of brutal oppression and abuse uh, under communist rule, Rogers was interviewing uh, Reverend Son about his perception of American Christianity. Now, Reverend Son said the key word in American Christianity, the one that everybody uses, is commitment. And he didn't like that very much. In fact, it didn't sit well with him, I'll say. This is, and you can't, I couldn't give you the entire thing, but I want to read you a couple of good quotes of what, in this interview that Adrian Rogers was having with Reverend Son, what he said. And here's the first quote. As a matter of fact, the word commitment did not come into great usage in the English language until about the 1960s. In Romania, we do not even have a word to translate the English word commitment. If you were to use commitment in your message tonight, I would not have a proper word to translate it with. with a new, when a new word comes into usage, it generally pushes an old word out. So I began to study and found the old word that commitment replaced, the word surrender. Now, Adrian Rogers, in this book that you see here, 
he then went on to ask Reverend Son, what's the difference between commitment and surrender? And here's what Pastor Son said. When you make a commitment, you are still in control. No matter how noble the thing you commit to, keep in mind too, this was an interview. This was not something he thought of and wrote. This is a uh, contemporaneous uh, place where he was speaking right just after being asked a question. When you make a commitment, you are still in control, no matter how noble the thing you commit to. One can commit to pray, to study the Bible, to give his money, or to commit to automobile payments, or to lose weight. Whatever he chooses to, he commits to. But surrender is different. If someone holds a gun and asks you to lift your hands in the air as a token of surrender, you don't tell that person what you're committed to. You simply surrender and do as you were told. Tony? You simply surrender and do as you were told. You can just walk that right on through. Here it is right here. If somebody asks you to surrender, you're not going to tell them how committed you are to your cause. Some might. I know it's not a... Surrender is different than commitment. But then he went on to say, Americans love commitment because they're still in control. Surrender is the key. It, it is a depth that's different. And it's opposite to how we are wired as human beings to be slaves. I'm even uncomfortable in this week. I was a little uncomfortable using that word, but it's necessary because I don't, I don't like the word. Because it's opposite of everything that we believe. We don't think we should be slaves to anyone, do you? I think that slavery was the worst stain on this country that there ever was. I think so many things about that that it makes me uncomfortable to even say the word or put it in a context but here, of a message. But here's what it is. It's because it's opposite to human nature for anyone to be, want, or be in slavery. And it still goes on all around the world too, by the way, unfortunately. In every context, it's proper to feel that way, to feel like I don't like slavery, I don't want to be a slave, I don't want anyone else to be. It's proper in every context to feel that way except one. We are slaves to Jesus Christ. We are to be slaves to him. That's not me using just a fancy word. That's in the scripture. You'll find it all over the place, but particularly in the New Testament, numerous times. It's also referred to as, depending on which translation you read, you'll see the word slaves. It's also known as bond servant. Has anyone ever seen that in the scripture? I'm a bond servant to Jesus Christ. That's saying I'm a slave to Jesus. Let me tell you where I'm going with this. When you're a slave, you're surrendered. You're not committed. You can like it or lump it, but you're surrendered. Most people today, when we talk about Jesus, it's like they're asking us to make a commitment to follow Jesus. Were you ready to make the commitment to follow Jesus? And again, I'm not saying there's anything terribly wrong with that word. I'm trying to talk about a completely different thing. As I develop this, I hope you'll see it. So, Maybe you'll commit, as Pastor Son said, to pray for certain needs. You'll commit to that. Maybe you'll commit to give financially. You know, and that's a good starting point. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with doing those things. But here's the thing. We're still steering the vehicle. We're still driving the vehicle of our life. When, what, how much that we commit is totally in our hands. It's totally up to us. We've We've, we've still got it under our sole discretion. And while we're still in control like that, we can choose at any moment to not be committed. That commitment that we have can change. It can go greater, it could go less, it could go away altogether because we're still in control. Marriage is like that. You know, we had a marriage conference here yesterday. Who was at the marriage conference? 
I'm telling you, it was awesome. So I'm just going to throw this out there. Don't think I'm trying to get mad at anybody or guilt you. But if you weren't here, you missed it. You need to come to these things, man. It was amazing. And I just, on the side note, I just want to thank Denise Anderson for putting this whole thing together. And I'm going to miss some people, and I'm going to try my best. But Cindy Hughes and, and our team, Karima and Jason, other people working all kinds of hours, put it all together, and it was awesome. So if you didn't make it, don't feel bad. We'll have another one. But these kind of things that we do, folks, I encourage you, be a part of it. it I think lives were changed and people look at marriage and, and get, get a different uh, depth of what they can do in their marriage. It was great. Okay. But marriage is a commitment. It's a commitment we make. You know what statistics tell me about that commitment? About half the people change their mind and decide I'm not committed anymore. <laughs> Sad as it is to say it's true. What about New Year's resolutions? Those are commitments. We all know how those work out. So I ask you this. Are there any places in your life like there are mine? So I'll, say, I'll speak for myself. Are there, are there any places, I asked myself this question this week numerous times. Are there any places in my life that are less than the best? Maybe they're even going all right. Maybe you'll call it, call it good. But are they less than the best? Any areas of my life that's less than the best? Is there? And then there's some places in my life and maybe some in yours too where I could say it's not even, it's less than good. What's Pastor Billy talking about? Here's the thing. When we're in the driver's seat, everything is less than best. I'm going to say that again for those of you. Maybe this side of the room can hear me better. I'm going to pull a Chris Michelson on you. When we're in the driver's seat, everything is less than best. Even if it's good, it's less than best. Do you want best? I want best. I'm not a prosperity gospel preacher. I'm not talking about all that stuff. I don't need to do all that. But here's the thing. I believe God wants us. Yes, there are other things we're going to have to go through. Yes, there are circumstances in our life. I absolutely believe God wants us to live our best life here on earth. I believe that. Why wouldn't he? Think he wants us to be miserable? Of course not. get into all of that but but what I will say is when we're in the driver's seat of our life it will always be less than best James 4 7 says this so submit say submit submit to the authority of God resist the devil stand firm against him and he will flee from you that's the amplified bible now that's great how many want to resist the devil and him flee did you know you have to do that first part first So submit to the authority of God. That's so what James is writing here. Verse speaks of surrender, not commitment. <laughs> In fact, I can tell you that submit, a synonym of submit is surrender. You know what some other ones are? Succumb, yield, acquiesce, bow to. Now let's substitute that word there. So surrender to the authority of God. So Yield to the authority of God. Acquiesce to the authority of God. Bow to the authority of God. Here's the thing, folks. God must be in control of our lives. He's got to be the boss. He's got to be. We have to recognize our need for him. We have to obey him. We have to listen to him. And we have to live for him. So what is that? What's surrendering to God? Okay, I'm going to give you two quick things. Talked about it a little bit, but here is one. Surrendering, surrender means giving up control. And I'm saying giving up control permanently. I'm giving it up and, and that's it. This is the way I'm living. I'm not going to hold on. I'm, I'm surrendering. It's like signing over ownership. Has anybody ever signed a title of a car when they've sold a car to somebody? I just had to do it recently. Or anything. You, you sign something over. We are signing over the ownership when we surrender. We're signing over the ownership of things that we think are ours. <laughs> that, we, that we think are our are, are, are stuff. Our time. 
Yes, some cases are possessions, whatever it may be. But surrender means recognizing this. What we own and what we have belongs to him. I know some of you are thinking, I worked hard, Pastor Billy, for this stuff. I've got these things. I've got my 401K, and there's nothing wrong with any of that. I've worked hard. I've achieved that. Or I've, I'm still trying to accomplish things and all that. Okay, go do all that. But make no mistake, it belongs to him. Now, you can argue with that and disagree with that if you want, and I certainly respect you and love you the same, but you're wrong. It all belongs to him. <laughs> you see why I said this is uncomfortable? I'm like, can I really say this stuff? To Lord, help me, Lord, help me. Another thing is when we surrender permanently, we are unequivocally declaring that he is in control of everything. Say everything. Say everything. He's in control of everything. That's I'm going to declare it when I'm surrendering. That's what I'm doing. Anybody's ever surrendered in a war or any kind of other battle situation or whatever, when they do that, they're saying, you're in control, not I'm surrendering you and I'm going to maintain my position as the general of my army. No, I'm in control now. <laughs> Whoever was surrendered to everything, and you got to declare it. Everything in our lives that we hope will work out to our favor is exclusively and entirely in the hands of God. You may think you have some influence over that, and you can, but still it all comes back to it's all his and he's gifted you and he's given you opportunities. You may not see it that way. You may not agree with it, but that's the way it is. So the first thing is that surrender is something that we do. We give up control permanently. And the next thing is that how do we surrender to God? Surrender is ditching our plan and adopting God's plan. Jettisoning ours, adopting his. And let me tell you something, I've said this before and we'll say it again today. God's plan is the best plan. You think your plan's better than God, I'm going to tell you again, you're wrong. <laughs> you're just wrong. Your plan can't possibly be as good as his. You've got to forget about what I want you, you, you've, in order to surrender. And you've got to fully embrace what God wants. What does he want, not what I want? And if there's a choice between, you know, I wish, really wish what God wanted for me was what I want, go his way. Because his plan is the best plan. I know that might sound like a platitude, but it's not. It's a scriptural truth. You got to do this to surrender. You got to completely abandon the belief that you know what's best. Because you don't. <laughs> About saying you don't have some wisdom and insight and that you're a capable person. I think I'm a capable person. Probably not as capable as a lot of you, but I'm, I feel like I've got some ability. But that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about who knows best. Father knows best. You ever see that show? I'm throwing that out there and half the people are like, what does that mean? <laughs> I'm talking about a different father. Father knows best. Forget, I mean, just let go of anything that we surrender is. Letting go of anything that keeps us from God's best. Matthew 6.10 says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's Jesus teaching us to pray. It's what we know as the Lord's Prayer, a portion of it. What if we prayed like this? Your will be done. Now, when you, let me break off here for a second. When you say that, you can say, well, I want God's will. How many have ever said that? I, I want God's will. I want God's will for my life. And that's a good thing if you did. So I'm hoping most of you have, but I'm sure not all of you, and that's okay. That's why we're talking today. I want God's will for my life. Every time, and what Jesus said here when you're praying, your kingdom come, your will be done. If we're saying your will be done and you say you want God's will for your life, you are saying at the same time, I am surrendering my will to his. Because if you aren't saying that, you don't want his will to be done. Hello? I'm going to try this side over here. 
Am I right? If you want his will to be done in your life and you say it, you have to surrender your will to his. You can't hold on to yours. Okay. So what if we prayed it like this? Your will be done in my marriage. Your will be done in my parenting. Your will be done in my finances. Your will be done in my career. Your will be done in my relationships. Your will be done in everything, everything, everything. When you're saying that, you're saying because I'm surrendering my will to yours. How do we live? And this is a question I'm asking. And Boy, I want to know the answer to this and I think I know the way to get there. How do we live a life at peace And in the full favor of God. How do we do that? We relinquish all control to him. That's how you get there. Am I saying doing it's easy? No. I'm saying it can be done though. And that's why we're talking about it. Because it's so important. And when we say we're giving control to God, we're not just giving it to some God. A God. We're giving it to the one true God. We're giving it to the God who created the universe by his spoken word. That's the God we serve. That's who we're talking about here. And if God created the universe, he's in control of it. He always has been. He always will be. God is in control. And if you haven't come around to that idea, you need to. And you need to put him in his rightful place. Not a place that you just, well, I'm going to decide to just put God. No, he, that's his rightful place to be first in your life. It's his rightful place for you to surrender everything to him. That's where he belongs in your life. He doesn't have to prove anything or do anything. It's up to us to do the doing. He's already done it all. Okay. You mad yet? I see a couple of people back there going, I came to be encouraged today, Pastor Billy. Well, God, I know you need it, believe me. This is encouraging. This is encouraging if you receive it, okay? It has been to me. Okay, so not because I'm anything I'm doing, but this is just, okay. So if you've not come around to this, you've got to. We, 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 we've, if we haven't come to that place of putting him in, in his rightful place, we've not submitted, like it said in James 4, 7. We've not made that decision yet. We've not surrendered. And God knows what's best for us, as I established a minute ago. I think most in this room would agree with that. Maybe not all, but I think almost everybody would agree with that. That if you believe in God, (laughs) God knows what's best. Okay, so if we can agree to that and stipulate to that, the truth is God is the only one that knows what's best. You don't. I don't. I don't know what's best for me. I don't know what's best for my family. I don't know what's best for my marriage. I don't know what's best for this church. I don't. But I know the one who does. He knows what's best. And he's the only one that does. So when we surrender, what we're saying is this, in a way. I surrender to who knows best. Do what's best for my family. I can't, I don't know what exactly that looks like please do what's best for my family because I'm trusting you with that do what's best for me (laughs) just God do what's best for me I'm surrendering to you and I'm asking you just do what's best for me what's the best for me do what's best for everything and everyone connected to me I'm surrendering to you because that's what I want. There was a song a while back called, um, it was a country song. It got a lot of popularity. It was actually the number one song. It was a song called, I'm going to hold just for a minute, Jesus Take the Wheel. Anybody ever heard? When, when I first heard that, I'm like, oh, man, they got some secular song out there now going to mock Jesus or have something about marginalized Jesus. Did you think that a little bit? Maybe too. Then I read the story of why the song was written. And I'm not going to go into that. You should do that. It's interesting. There's an actual story that happened that birthed the song. 
And then I read the lyrics. I didn't listen to it. I listened to it, too, and it's, it's a really cool song. It's a beautiful song. A wonderful singer. Christian girl, too, as I understand it. That, that Carrie, Underwood. Carrie Underwood. That's right. Didn't know if I, need, I could say that because of copyright things. I might cut off our stream right now. <laughs> I have to, be, have to be like, seriously, I have to be super careful. For instance, we couldn't play that song right now. Anyway, we could sing it, but we couldn't play their version. Anyway, okay. But listen to what it says. This is the chorus. Many of you probably know it. I don't even know if I can get through it. Jesus, take the wheel. Take it from my hand. Because I can't do this on my own. I'm letting go. Give me one more chance to save me from this road I'm on. Jesus, take the wheel. When we let God drive us, when we give him that wheel, when we let him drive us to where we need to go, we can always know this. We're always going to get to the place that we need to go the fastest way, the best way, the way that's going to have the less least complications. There won't be wrong turns. There won't be U-turns. There won't be additional stops and exits that we take to distract things. When we let him drive the vehicle of our life, he's going to go A to B straight where it needs to go. All the other things that we'll mess up and mix up, that won't happen. He's got it all mapped out. And by the way, God's had it all mapped out from before you were born. <laughs> His plan's in place. <laughs> so if we're not willing, though, here's the other side of it. If we're not willing to let him drive, then what we're doing is we're tempted to take that wheel back, start driving on our own. Then what happens is we start winding up in some wrong turns. Some dead ends, some places where, oh, I messed up, man. I've wasted all of this. I've got to U-turn and go back where I started. I've got to get, now I, I'm trying to get here, and now I've had all these obstacles and roadblocks and things that are happening and messing me up. I'm sorry to say, that's doing life our way instead of his way. But when we finally surrender, when that happens... See, at that moment, that's when God can accomplish all he wants to do in your life. Now, I'm not saying God can't bless you before you get to that point. He can, and he does, by the way. I'm not, so I'm not saying that's an all or nothing thing. But if you want all God wants for you, if you want all the blessings, if you want all of the favor, there's a surrender that has to take place. And here's the other part of that. When you do surrender, he can accomplish everything. But here's the other part of it. Until we do that, he cannot accomplish everything he wants to do for us. He cannot accomplish everything he wants to do in our family and in our marriage and in our parenting and in our life in all places that it takes us. He can't do that. Now, that's not because he's limited in power and ability. I'm sure somebody will walk out and say, well, Pastor Billy's saying God can't do something. It's not because he's limited in power and ability. He is not. He is almighty. He is all powerful. He is all knowing. He is all present. He is all, all, all. The above and more. No, it's not that. It's because we're choosing to go another path than the one that he's laid out for us. That's when we get messed up. So when we commit to something and we're directing things, we're, we've got the will it might work out sometimes here and there, but there's a lot of times it's not. But the other side of it is when we surrender, when we do that, we're handing over to the control to the one who can accomplish it all. We're handing it over to the one who can make it succeed. And here's the other thing. When we hand it over to him, in fact, he cannot fail his plan never fails. That's the plan I want to be on. John 12, 24, and 25. Quick. I assure you, unless it's Jesus speaking here, I assure you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone, just one grain, never more. But if it dies, it produces much grain and yields a harvest. 
The one who loves his life eventually loses it through death, but the one who hates his life in this world and is concerned with pleasing God will keep it for life eternal. Let me say something about this. When we let go, things begin to grow. I'm going to say that again. When we let go, things begin to go, go, grow. God brings the growth. And Jesus is teaching us something very important here. I want you to listen to me. Jesus is teaching us here, for something to multiply and flourish in our lives, something has to die first. Something has to die first. Galatians 5.24 says, And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Crucifying, by the way, means death. Jesus was crucified. He died. That's, the, that's what everybody in that day, that was the way you said it. We crucify the flesh. We crucify our desires. We crucify what we want. In order for something to multiply and grow and flourish in our life, something has to die first. But the good news is the blessings of God are fully released. Fully released and rain down on those who surrender and give up control. The joy of the Lord comes that we, how many have heard the joy? I've heard about this joy of the Lord and I just seem to always feel like I'm down and I don't feel good. I don't know if Pastor Billy, if I'm really getting that whole thing about the joy of the Lord. The joy of the Lord comes when you let go of everything and you trust him. And it's in his hands. That's when you begin to experience that. Putting in him, him in full control. Not being controlled by your circumstances. Not being controlled by your sickness. Not being controlled by your issues. Not being controlled by anything. But he's in control. When that happens, the full measure of God's blessings are released. And not only that, you're going to find the joy of the Lord. More than you've ever. I'm not saying you haven't experienced it a little bit. Now I'm saying, but more than you've ever had before. You're going to go, I get it. I get it. I see what they mean now with this joy of the Lord thing. Even in my darkest moments, even in the tough times, I've got the joy of the Lord. And you know what the scripture says? The joy of the Lord is our, it's our strength. That's when we find true peace. That's when we have that God-given peace. Ushers, I'm going to ask you if you could to hand out those things for us, if you would. C.S. Lewis wrote a book called Mere Christianity. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of it. But it's a really popular book that he wrote. A lot of people know C.S. Lewis. By the way, they're going to hand you out something. I'll tell you why in a minute. I want everyone to get one for couples because we can only get so many, whatever it was, supply. If I could, everybody, if you're a couple, take one. And then if we have some left over, we'd be happy to give them. I want everybody to have one, though. Maybe we've got enough for everybody. I'm not sure. But I do want you to have it, and I just want you to take it, but continue to listen to what I'm, what I'm sharing with you. Here's what C.S. Lewis said. The more we get what we now call ourselves, he put it in quotes. The more we get what we now call ourselves out of the way and let him take us over, the more truly ourselves we become. I know that's a deep thought, but the more what he's really saying there is that when we get rid of us, that's when we become who God created us to be. That's the true ourselves. So when we let go, things grow. And without surrender, though, I'm going to tell you, we're always traveling a second best journey. You will never be in the first best journey. If you, now, sometimes you also might be in the third best, the fourth best, the fifth best journey. You might not even be in second. But you'll never get more than the second best journey as long as you're traveling with, without surrender. But when you surrender to the better plan, to God's plan, the plan of the one who made you, that's when things start to happen. So as I'm wrapping up here, how do I surrender to God? There's two things I want to give you. The first one, it gets really simple here, guys. Choose. Make a decision. By the way, I can't make that decision for you. Did you know that? I can't make it for you. You can't make it for me. You can't make it for your wife. She can't make it for you. She can make every other decision, guys. Amen. Amen. But she can't make this one. You have to. To choose. How do I surrender? I choose. The song we sang earlier is I surrender all. 
I surrender all. All to thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. You know, we don't just need to sing that song, though, now. We need to sing it. It's great to sing it. It's a great song to sing because it's talking about everything I'm talking about right here. I surrender not. I, you know, I don't know if you've ever heard it sung this way. I surrender some. I surrender what I feel like. I've never heard that version. I surrender all. That version came out and then I think it got canceled and they put this. <laughs> they were like, I don't think that's good. It, 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 and so what I'm saying is we don't just need to sing it though. We need to pray it. We need to live it. We need to embrace it. We need to choose. We need to decide it. I surrender all. Make it the desire of our heart. You know, there's no greater act of faith. Everything we do following Jesus is, is about faith. We could talk about that, and I've got some things I'm developing for a little series coming up. But I, I, faith is what it's all about. But listen, there's no greater act of faith than surrender. When you're surrendering, you're putting all your faith into him. You're saying, I'm trusting you above it all. So how do you surrender to God? You choose. Only you can do it. You make a decision. The next thing you can do is this. You surrender daily. It is not a one-time occurrence. I'm going to tell you how I know this. There's this thing called Luke 9.23. <laughs> and it's one of the most powerful verses that you'll ever read and see. And Jesus is speaking here. And Jesus said to all. That's us, by the way. If anyone would come after me, let him deny. Say deny. Let him deny himself and take up his cross. When? Daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. This should happen every day. How do I surrender to God? I'm telling you, you choose and you do it every day. Maybe sometimes even multiple times a day. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. It says daily, but it doesn't say you couldn't do it more than once. And in fact, I've done that. But if you don't think that I, and I don't think you can either, go through a whole day and not at some point deny yourself more than once or twice, then, then you're not really thinking of things the way we should think of them. We have to do that. Denying yourself is also the verse we read in Galatians, crucifying the flesh, crucifying our desire. So it needs to happen every day. Let it go. Let God take over. Do it daily. Like the song said, I'm letting go. Take it from my hand because I can't do this on my own. You do it every day just like Jesus take the wheel. So always remember this, folks. It's not how committed you are. It's not how committed you are to the cause of Christ. And commitment in and of itself, the word is not bad. But it's not com how committed you are. It's how surrendered you are. That's the difference maker. It's the difference maker for me. It's the difference maker for this church. So the bottom line is this. Our life is not our own. Rob, if I could get you to come, please. This life we live here is not our own. You might think of it that way, and I, I respect it, but it's not true. Our life is not our own. It belongs to to God it belongs to him and I will tell you this I'm talking about surrender today I'm talking about things that make people uncomfortable and say all that I do want to say this surrender is not punitive surrender other way of saying it is not a bad thing surrender in fact as uncomfortable as it might make us is the best thing that you can ever do in your life following Jesus the best and it's the other part of it is, it's what God deserves. He deserves this from us. He deserves it because I don't think it's unreasonable at all to expect this from a Savior that came down from heaven to live among us as a human being and decided on his own sacrificially that he was going to go to a cross and die a criminal's death for me. <laughs> what more could he give what more could Jesus give is it unreasonable 
for me to surrender to him. He deserves our worship. And we read this at the beginning, Romans 12, 1. I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he's done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice that he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. If you want to worship a God who died for you by sending his son and, and, and his son dying for you here and being resurrected from the power of God to prove he was who he said he was and to do what he needed to do in his finished work here on earth to provide a pathway for us to have forgiveness of our sins and be in eternity and in heaven with him forever. If you want to worship somebody like that, a God like that who deserves our worship, here's the way you do it. This is the truly the way to worship him give your bodies to him let them be a living and holy sacrifice that he will find acceptable all of that means surrender are you ready to surrender today let's stand please if you would here's your challenge today I've got those flags with you for one reason I want you to take those home with you I want you to put them in a place that you can't miss it I don't care if it's on the counter of your kitchen, if it's somewhere in your car, maybe you put it in a little holder or between the seats or something. I don't know. I want you to take that flag and just keep it. And this week when you look at it, all I'm asking you to do is this. I'm asking you to say, is there something I can surrender? You can decide that now too. But you also something that's daily. So tomorrow when you see that flag, just think, what can I surrender? What should I do? What can I do to open up the pathway so God can do everything he wants to do in my life? Take an inventory of your life and find out where those places are and you'll find them. The Holy Spirit will help you do that. What areas do we need to surrender or where do we need to surrender more to him? What areas are we trying to control and make them work on our own? What do I need to do to surrender? Let that flag just be a memory of this moment today that you can challenge yourself to answer that question. Because folks, listen to me, look at me. It's a question worth answering. It will make a difference in your life.